long years ago, we made a trip with destiny, and now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. A moment comes, which comes but rarely in history, when we step out from the old to the new. It is fitting that at this solemn moment we take the pledge of dedication to the service of India and her people and to the still larger cause of humanity. Hello everyone and welcome to India Colonized, a podcast dedicated to South Asia's modern and contemporary history. I am your co-host Ritika Chauhan and this is Guftagu, a special series where we discuss and engage with varied authors and scholars of South Asian history. In this episode of Guftagu, we have with us Dr. Raghav Kishore, author of the book The Ungovernable City, Productive Failures in the Making of Colonial Delhi. Dr. Raghav Kishore is a historian of modern South Asia and his research primarily focuses on the transformation of urban governance under colonial rule in the 19th and 20th centuries. This book examines the production of urban space and its relation to colonial governance in Delhi in the aftermath of the Great Rebellion of 1857 until the transfer of the colonial capital to the city in 1911. Contesting the popular view that the aftermath of the rebellion was a period of political stability, Dr. Raghav Kishore creatively demonstrates how the tensions, contradictions and failures of colonial policies were responsible for the unintended development of state capacity and it also provided opportunities for Delhi's residents and social groups to assert their claims to city spaces. This volume brings to scrutiny Delhi's cultural, economic and political transitions and the relationships between local, regional and imperial governments during this period. Demonstrating how conflicting agendas of urban policy could stifle specific state initiatives This book further argues that such misadventures or failures should be seen as productive because on the one hand, it provides a language of new legal codes for the population with which to assail the state and on the other hand, it also enlarges the latter's bureaucracy and regulatory capabilities. This interview explores and examines the provided stances in the book, along with other broader perspectives on the history of colonial Delhi. Here's the conversation with Dr. Raghav Kishore. Um, So let me start with a couple of biographical questions. The first of them being, uh, tell us a bit about yourself, uh, the kind of intellectual journey you've had and the people who've influenced you or the books who've influenced you uh, into becoming an academician or a historian. Okay, so, well, thanks for that. I mean, I, um, so I, my name is Raghav and uh, I am um, an LSC fellow uh, at the LSC. Um, I finished my PhD uh, at SOAS, um, the School of Oriental and African Studies in in London. And um, uh, since then, I've done a few fellowships here and there and I've taught uh, at a a few different places in the UK. Uh, And currently, as I mentioned, I'm I'm a fellow uh, at the LSC. Um, in terms of my own my background, uh, I actually uh, did my master's in uh, in Delhi in Delhi University, um, and I was actually a medieval uh, historian. So I studied medieval Indian history, and uh, um, so uh, when I was studying there, um, I worked with uh, Professor Sunil Kumar, uh, who um, who's no longer with us, but he was a really inspiring professor, and he um, you know he uh, sort of. Uh, encouraged me to think about Delhi and th- think about, you know, the history of the, 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 of the city. Um, obviously, he was a medieval historian, so, you know, I was, I was studying medieval history, but uh, my interests were slightly different from that. But but he was the one that kind of got me thinking about uh, also walking the city and sort of, you know, exploring the city, thinking about its urban transformation um, and then through various sites. So I kind of did that and I worked, uh, I also worked in tourism for some time and, uh 
And then after that, I wasn't quite happy with what I was doing. And I came back to academia. Uh, and then well, that's when I started at SOAS and I, I finished my PhD at SOAS. So um, in a way, uh, that was what I uh, was kind of, I kind of came around doing. Uh, but I was also, um, you know, I also read uh, books on the city, for example, Manarani Gupta and others, historians who've, who've uh, been quite prolific, who are really important. Um, and I was thinking about the transformation of the city in the 19th century, for example. And I kind of found that there were questions that I um, wanted to raise. And also that some of the themes that uh, she'd raised to follow up and actually think more about Probe Deeper. And, uh, and, and that was the kind of, uh, yeah, that was kind of my uh, foray into kind of the history of, of the city. Um, in terms of um, the kind of, you know, I, I was, so my, my research has been, it's on the, obviously in the history of the city of Delhi, but it's also on urban governance. And it's also, um, you know, on urban history more generally in South Asia. So it's, so it's, the, it's the state and, you know, state and um, governance. Um, and there have been academics who I've read and I've kind of thought about whether writing on India, whether it's Akhil Gupta and others on the state, or uh, it's about the sort of urban historians more generally on South Asia, whether it's Prashant Kadambi or uh, Steve Legg or, you know, others who've kind of, uh, um, Jyoti Osagra, et cetera, who I've kind of learned from um, and thought through with their work and kind of uh, thought about some of the things that they've raised. That's wonderful. Um, so for the sake of our audience, could you tell us about uh, the scope of urban history? So what exactly does it include? What, what are you studying when you're studying urban history? So, I mean, that's a good, so that's an interesting question. I think when you study urban history, I mean, I think that the, one of the things that we can, uh, you know, I'd maybe talk about how urban history is developed in, in, in India, so the, the historiography of urban history, I think. Uh, so, you know, urban history isn't, you know, is, uh, there have been works in urban history in the 70s, 80s, Gupta, for example, I mentioned, uh, but it's only in the late 90s and actually in the mid 2000s that urban history kind of kicked off, took off. Um, and and some historians have actually talked about that as an urban turn, you know, in South Asian history more broadly. And 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 I think Gyan Prakash makes that argument, uh, and Prashant Kidambi also does that. And they, what was happening was that for a long time, you know, the the rural was considered as the authentic site of uh, Indian modernity, uh, you know, the experience and so on. So uh, the focus was on that kind of uh, sort of the rural. Uh, that was the basis, the focus for a lot of historians. Um, but so it's the late 90s, people started questioning this and sort of thinking more about the urban, thinking about uh, the urban, not just as a, as a uh, you know, not just in terms of riots or, or um, you know, um, things like that, but more in terms of the urban experience, more seriously, taking it more seriously. And so that's when you have in the late sort of 90s and early 2000s, uh, people, uh, historians thinking about questions of modernity, in, in, you know, in the urban, so what does it mean, uh, you know, how, how, how does that shape the urban experience, for example, what does it mean to be modern, and what can the city uh, tell you, and how is it different from, let's say, uh, the experience of modernity in uh, London or Paris or, you know, so so people started thinking about modernity in the, uh, and and in, uh, in, you know, South Asia, the city's own tryst with modernity, right? So, and uh, one, some of the things that they talked about, and this early, you know, the, the, um, as I said, this is mid, late 2000s, so it's not that long ago, but you had people, you know, you had, uh, you know, uh, Will Glover writing about Lahore, you had um, Prashant Kidami on Bombay, you had uh, Preeti Chopra also on Bombay, you had Jyoti Usagraha, who was talking you know, on Delhi, and uh, they, they were talking about sort of, what does modernity mean and sort of how do you understand the urban experience? So, and they, they talked about how it's contested and, and fraught and, um, and different really. So in terms of, you know, the, the experience of the, the global South uh, as opposed to um, global North. And, and so they were, they were looking at these themes. So, uh, so that's kind of where the discipline has come from now, but there are lots of studies now that have kind of, you know, Sort of taken aspects that were, you know, there there, is, there are historical geographers like Steve Legg who are who are talking about sort of governmentality and, and the city and you know how um, bodies are governed and, and how they're regulated, etc. So there's there's work on that. There is um, and and yeah and you know there have been uh, studies on um, suburbanization in Southeast Asia, how that's different from let's say 
what's happening in the Americas and so on. So, so that's where the field is. And, you know, uh, in, in many ways, people are, are thinking outside of now, let's say, sort of these big cities like, you know, the port cities or, or in colonial times or Delhi, Bombay, Calcutta. These are the big kind of, um, so they're thinking outside of those, but they're also thinking in terms of um, thinking about periodization, thinking about, uh, you know, legacies between colonial, post-colonial, what the relationships are. So in a, in a sense, the field is a, is a vibrant one, um, you know, with stuff on imaginaries, et cetera. So it's, it's very exciting. It's an exciting time to be an urban historian. So it's a scope covering quite many disciplines. It's, it's quite interdisciplinary. Yeah. Um, so tell us the journey of your book, uh, this particular project. What uh, attracted you to do this project? How was, uh, how was your experience doing it? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, I think, I, I, as I mentioned, I... Um, I was, I did medieval history, so I was really interested in the history of the city and um, Delhi and changing fortunes of Delhi. And I was interested in, you know, uh, different political dispensations that had governed Delhi and and uh, that was my basis. I also used to walk around and take tours of Delhi and so on when I used to so study. So was, uh, and that's what sort of made me just go into tourism and take, take that direction. But obviously, I was not very satisfied when I was doing that. Uh, and uh, then sort of I applied for a PhD at SOAS. Uh, it was an MPhil slash PhD uh, at SOAS. Um, and then I got in and I, I you know, I um, did that. Um, um, and that kind of was my kind of basis in uh, and, uh, looking at the city. I, you know, I decided to, the, the, the nature of the PhDs in England are three to four years. So they, they, they're quite compact. Uh, and uh, and so one of the things that I kind of shaped the the questions, but also the archives and so on, was thinking about how I'd manage my time in those sort of three to four uh, years in which I had to finish, really. Uh, so um, so any kind of uh, grandeurs and ambition or anything that I had about um, doing uh, lots of different things, uh, you know, which I possibly would have done in, in six years maybe and in America, but I had to think very carefully about uh, what I was going to do, how I was going to manage my time. Uh, what kind of archives I would look at. And uh, that kind of shaped also the questions that I was going to ask. And then obviously the, the experience of, of actually going to the archives made me change the questions that I had started off with because of the material that I had kind of looked at. And so that was, that was how so I kind of So talking about the archives, um, what were the kind of limitations that you had while doing your research, um, the kind of sources that might be missing? or, uh, you know, the access to archives, records, and uh, how good they were basically kept or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, so one is the question about access, which, uh, you know, and the others is about kind of limitations, is, uh, and more generally, um, you know, I think in terms of limitations, as I mentioned, there's uh, the degrees here, uh, as when I started, it was a four-year thing, which I had to kind of, the fourth year was an extra, extra add-on year, but really three years in which, so you had uh, first year kind of narrowing down, honing your questions, second year doing your field work, third year writing up. And essentially you would ideally, for the, from the university's perspective, you would finish in three years and then you had an extra year if you wanted to, you know, uh, if you had some more to do. I mean, um, but so in, in a sense, uh, I had to really think about um, what I could, you know, feasibly do in that time. So, so, um, and when I, and when I visited the archives in India, so, so my, there's some material that I looked at um, in the British library in, in England, in London, and, uh, and I found some material, but I really actually found a lot of interesting stuff uh, in the, you know, in this 19th century period, late 19th century in the Delhi State Archives in, uh, in Delhi, um, in the Kutub Institution area in Delhi. And that's um, and that those archives are really so the, the material that they have is really rich and the archivists are really friendly and they were really helpful. Um, and the material isn't at least the time that I saw it wasn't uh, organized uh, in, uh, really well. They were but they were beginning to come to terms with what they had and were beginning to come to terms with kind of making it more user friendly. And I think that they, that that process is carried on now and they are doing much better now than they were. Uh, but from my perspective, th actually that was, you know, when I started using those archives, they were actually quite, uh, you know, the, as I mentioned, the archives were quite helpful, but the problem was that a lot of their stuff was, um, was in different places. So, uh, you know, the, I didn't know, for example, of uh, 
the library, which was which was separate from the the main the the, the consultation room, right? Uh, I got to know that quite late, and I then I looked at st- stuff which I which I had. So uh, so, but I believe the coordination between these kind of different places is is better now. But back then, that was an issue that I faced. I, I also spent time in the municipal archives, which uh, in the Delhi Town Hall. And actually, that's where I found that, you know, there was a lot of rich stuff that I found. Um, but uh, the person who gave access to that, I mean, it, it isn't a formal archive. Um, I mean, the, and, the, and the person in charge of, uh, you know, public relations is who gave the material to me what they had. Now, interestingly, they had more uh, in a different area, in a different place, which I didn't know about. Um, so again, there was that, you know, the, it didn't work as an official archive, unlike the Delhi State Archives or the National Archives of India. So there was that issue that I had kind of an accessing work. Um, but again, you know, in terms of my own limitations is that, you know, I I looked at some work in, in uh, literature in Urdu, which, you know, I can, which I can read, but ideally I should have spent more time uh, looking at, you know, um, uh, petitions, et cetera, which I have some of them, uh, but there are police records, uh, for example, in the Nehru Memorial uh, Museum Library um, from the 1860s to the 80s and so on, which, uh, but they're written in Shikasht, so it's, it's a bit tough to read. Uh, so, you know, so, so there are issues that I kind of, you know, had I spent more time uh, perhaps, and uh, maybe that would have been resolved, but then again, given the, the positive time in terms of the four-year degree and so on, so it was a bit difficult. So, so there are my own kind of limitations, but also the limitations of the, the archives that I kind of... So coming back to the book, um, just want to know the kind of approach and methodology that you've used to kind of build a narrative of your book. Yeah, in terms of, you know, um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, that uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, historians have started thinking about is taking the urban way seriously in, on its own terms. Um, and, um, you know, and one of the, um, one of the, the points that the arguments is that, you know, the modern, modernity, for example, is negotiated, contested, etc. And, and that was one of the arguments brought about. So what historians are, have also done along with that is to show that, you know, the state, for example, isn't omnipotent, it is, uh, it is lots of contradictions, there are lots of um, policy failures, for example, there are lots of incomplete plans, and it's not a monolith, uh, so that's what they're arguing. And one of the things that I wanted to do in the book was to, to take this notion of uh, policy failure, for example, or to, to place contradictions at the heart of the book and to think about what does that mean rather than actually to say that, well, as the end point of that. So you know, I wanted to take it as the beginning and think about how does that, what does that do to the state and what does that, uh, you know. And the way that I came across was I, I sort of looked at the, the urban stuff that was going on in, in South Asia, but then I went back to the stuff on the state uh, so people who had written about sort of the state uh, in South Asia, but also, uh, you know, um, uh, Timothy Mitchell and uh, um, others who have written on Egypt and, um, and, and you know, and anthropologists, et cetera, from who have written on Africa. And, uh, and I found, you know, a couple of, um, uh, particularly one that's come out, came out about 10 years or so by William Cunningham, this book on Zanzibar, and when he also talks about um, uh, the planning, urban planning, and uh, you know, in Zanzibar, and so and uh, and so, so this kind of helped me to think about uh, the the notion of failure more critically and more uh, sensitively, and handle it, and think about what does it mean in terms of the longevity of the state, and I kind of linked the two together. Um, so, so yeah, I came. Fr- I mean, the book has t- touches also engages with um, you know the literature on governmentality, for example, the more Foucauldian stuff as well. Uh, but also, um, but also tries to engage with these sort of the debates about the state and you know anthropologists and so on that have uh, talked about this in the in the recent past and so on. All right. Um, so before we can go into um, talking chapter wise about your book, um, if you could, for the sake of our audience, uh, in a brief manner, just tell us what the project is about, what exactly the book is about. Yeah, so the, the urban, so the, so the ungovernable, uh, ungovernable city is uh, about the urban transformation of Delhi between 1857 and 1911, well, 1858 and 1911, really. It's this time when uh, Delhi is, uh, after the mutiny of, or rebellion, uh, you know, of 1857, when Delhi is relegated in its political status, um, it is the story of that urban transformation 
and, and a governance of the city. So between that and the time that it becomes the capital of India in 1911, the British India, that is. So it is that kind of, uh, it's, the book is based on that period, which is a, a shorter period, uh, and rather than actually a longer duration, which looks at sort of the whole 19th century, 20th century, and so on. So it's a very kind of uh, targeting focused uh, study of governance in this. All right. Um, so we just wanted to start with the question about um, the study of colonial urban history in particular, and uh, or the study of urbanism. How has that evolved over the period of time? How has the subject evolved over the period of time? And especially with context to South Asia. Yeah, I mean, I think the context of South Asia and urbanism is, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, so that there, there are, you know, there was, there were works on um, urbanism and urban governance and, you know, municipal uh, uh, studies on the municipalization, uh, which were there in the 50s and 60s. And, um, and th- from that, there were studies and, you know, there were, there were isolated studies, but they were good, solid studies. You know, you have Mariam Dosal on, on Bombay, you had, are people working on um, power, the, the nature of power and planning uh, in uh, in urban sites in uh, South Asia, uh, Bombay, Calcutta, etc. Um, but you had what was the, the way this literature. You had Anthony King, uh, I should mention, who was very very influential. You know, you had uh, they, they were looking at the operation of colonial power and and how uh, power was organized in in these sites. And Anthony King worked on Delhi and you know Mayan Dosan in Bombay. Uh, Narayani Gupta, you had uh, on Delhi again. Um, you know, so you're to- talking about um, how power was organized, and uh, you know, with a, with kind of talking about you know how the city was governed. So these were these were some of the earlier kind of works on um, on urbanism. You also had studies on port cities, you know, uh, uh, which the development of port cities, uh, and in the 1980s you had uh, the slight, you know, you had. Um, Works that were, you know, or in seventies and eighties, you had, uh, were talking about, you know, the, the way urban power and uh, was able to shape the colonial power was able to reshape the city, and and so you had works on um, Avad, and you know you had Vina uh, uh, Oldenburg's work on Avad, for example, and some of the arguments, uh, you know, that they, that were made at that time were about this totalizing control, this this way that uh, colonial power was able to completely reshape. Um, the city in its own image. So, so you had that kind of work that was going on in the 80s. And then, as I mentioned, you know, this was, these were few and far between. Uh, the majority of the stuff that was focused on, for a long time, in fact, um, was focused on the rural, because the rural was seen as the authentic site of, you know, in the Indian experience, the Indian majority. Um, and, and this goes back to a kind of an earlier Gandhian, you know, influence on the village uh, being the authentic uh, marker of, in, of Indian life. So, so that, you know, uh, but so in the late 90s, then this, there was a transformation in thinking about the urban. Again, Prakash then talked about this in the Sarai, you know, in, in the, in an article in Sarai. And uh, then this was taken up by these, these studies that I mentioned earlier, uh, focusing on modernity, the, you know, and, and the, the urban experience. And one of the things that they've, the historians have been able to do is to think about, you know, not just looking at, um, you know, um, contestation and so on, but also thinking about urban imaginaries, so how people imagine the city, how they, you know, thought about it, and taking that as seriously as, let's say, uh, the organization of colonial power. And, uh, yeah, and so there's, so the, so the historiography, obviously this, I'm giving you a potted kind of history of this, but uh, but it's quite, as I said, it's quite a, a vibrant field and, and quite a, uh, yeah, right now. Yeah, um, so, what exactly are the kind of um, complexities and in the interactions uh, uh, when it came of Delhi gov- when it came about um, uh, to about Delhi governance? Uh, you know, will we be able to explore some of them as we move forward? Just want to know when it came to governing Delhi, what were the kind of complexities that were uh, going on? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I've kind of looked at, so in the 19th century, one of the interesting things that comes out in the book that I've kind of touched upon is that, you know, um, you have, you know, um, after 1857-58, you have uh, you have a plethora of organizations that come to govern the city. And you've got, for example, uh, you've got, for the first time, you've got, you know, uh, sanitary inspectors, you've got foresters, you've got... 
um, you know, uh, local administration personnel, you've got a municipal, you've got municipal officials. So what I, you know, so in terms of complexity is what I was interested in and how these kind of institutions interact, how these, or these people, these bodies, these committees and so on interact with one another. And um, what I actually, uh, you know, realized is that if you, if you uh, read both along the grain and against the grain in the archive, you realize that it's quite a fractious, it's quite a contentious thing between these kind of organizations, between these agencies, between these bodies. And, uh, you know, there, there are accusations, there are, um, there are, there's, you know, um, in, you know, there, there are people fighting with one another, there are accusations of dilettantism and, and so on, uh, which make it very interesting to think about how sort of, uh, how these, these uh, organizations work, these committees work. And, What's interesting is that despite all this contestation, what they do is, you know, if you take the municipality, this is something uh, the munici municipal organizations are with us even today, right? So they they this they started in the 1860s, all across India, and uh, but the municipal committees are these these com uh, committees who um, they have disputes with one another, but they also have disputes with uh, you know in terms of uh, the the. The population in terms of different people, res uh, the residents of the city, and what this does, as I kind of talk about in the book, is that um, you know, there are contradictory policies that are followed, which uh, which create problems for their own functioning. Um, but at the same time, what you do is that you know this doesn't mean that it's just it's simply failure, because what happens is that uh, you know there are committees that are formed, there are it takes them into new directions. Right. So, so I've kind of used the municipality as a good case because there's a lot of rich evidence there in which uh, most of the things that they kind of try up, they get, they get sort of trapped in a lot of problems that they, they create for themselves. And it exacerbates a lot of urban problems, right? Whether it's drainage, whether it's sanitation. Uh, so they, they respond, you know, their, their internal contradictions and so on are responsible for creating even more urban problems. But what that does eventually also is that, it, you know, they, they have, committees, they have surveys, etc. And all of these bodies, etc. work alongside, right? So this, they create kind of new ways of working around it. So, so while you have all these problems, and you have these guys fighting with one another, you also have all these newer kind of ways that they're kind of thinking, oh, well, let's, let's do this, then let's do this to counter it, let's do this. And that creates, uh, you know, new bodies, new people working there, increases its uh, regulatory capacity, uh, bureaucracy, and so on. So the state is expanding, in, is, is what I'm trying to suggest. So with, um, with the kind of interactions that are happening between these uh, different governing bodies, the complexity arises and that basically arises them to become, you know, new opportunities rising up as they move on. Yeah. So um, if you could help the audience locate Delhi in context to your work and uh, what the audience needs to know about Delhi before they can delve into the book further, um, before 1857 and during the uh, period which your book covers. Yeah, I mean, I think so to so give a backdrop in terms of what's happening in Delhi, uh, you know, um, the period that I've looked at is, uh, as I mentioned, after the mutiny of 1857, other rebellion of 1857, um, and there's historiography on this uh, too, in terms of, you know, whether it should be called a rebellion, whether it was a mutiny, the older colonial term mutiny isn't accepted. It's accepted as a rebellion, but not necessarily. And it's a, there's a, um, you know, I think between a war of independence or rebellion. So there's that kind of historiography on this. But, uh, you know, but prior to this, we have, we have um, in the 19th century, in the late, um, in the early 19th century, you have, um, you know, you, you have the city, which is, uh, as Narani Gupta suggests, is a city between two empires. You've got, you know, you've got obviously the Mughals who are still in uh, um, Delhi, but they, the, you know, you've got the residency uh, system in Delhi, which is where the, the resident has uh, controls um, um, all the shots. But, but, uh, but you know, but um, the historians have also suggested that, you know, Michael Mann and so on have worked on Delhi and said that, you know, despite there being these kind of two, two points of power, uh, you know, you, one has to see that, uh, that, that there is, for example, um, a lot of chaos at this point in time because of the way 
uh, the residents don't really have a grip on on things the way they work, right? So they have to. So you have you have grain riots, and you've got a lot of things that happen in which uh, um, it causes a, quite a tumultuous situation there in the early nineteenth century. What uh, the the rebellion, you know, of eighteen fifty seven does is it effectively takes away the Mughals, right? So it uh, it takes away the Mughals, and what happens with that is that. Um, you know, there's also a vacuum in the city because what happens is that uh, just after the rebellion of 1857, um, you know, Muslims are ejected from the city, right? So the Muslims are held as the key conspirators of the of the rebellion, and uh, they are the ones who are the fingers pointed at Muslims, the Muslims of Delhi, as as you know, as being part. So the the Hindus uh, are also ejected, but they have a uh, they are you know their temples aren't destroyed, for example. So there is a there's a very clear bias there in terms of what should be, how retribution should be carried out or not. Um, there's also, um, there are some, you know, that, that, that who um, are also negotiating, um, uh, people who live in Dariba, etc., who are also trying to negotiate with the, with the colonial government uh, and so on afterwards. Um, and one of the things that I picked up in the book is that, you know, it's to, to think about that, that, just after the rebellion, the the, the state is, is is not just a you know a, a case of destruction and devastation, but it also wants to reestablish its power. And one of the ways it does that is to try and think about who it can co-opt uh, into you know and sort of intermediaries. Uh, in, in yeah, and and that's where the question of sort of property allocations and so on comes into into uh, the discussion. Um, and also, uh, sort of in, the, in terms of the municip- municipality, where uh, who is to be co-opted, who has, you know, who is who has been loyal, who is not. The question of loyalty hangs upon, you know, quite heavily on the on the administration, and that question of loyalty is is something that you know they they have to deal with and they have to grapple with, whether it's uh, whether it's in the municipality, whether it's in allocations of property, and you know, this gives a, a bit of scope for people to to. To, to negotiate, obviously it's on different terms, but but it gives people a little bit of uh, you know how we should sort of go about and yeah. Right. So I was going to come to the question about uh, how the colonial authorities were compensating the loyal Indians and the whole question of loyalty and the distribution of uh, you know the property, the process and mechanism. Could you like briefly cover about the process and the mechanism which they uh, took in order to compensate these loyal Indians? Yeah. So I think the compensation thing it was I found that very interesting when I was looking at it because uh, you know the, the standard narrative that was given is that there is um, you know there is a lot of wanton destruction after. Uh, the rebellion in, in terms of, you know, there are these prize agents who loot property and who who kill and, and, and so on. But one of the things that I kind of, uh, you know, found was that actually you have at the higher levels of, uh, you know, uh, the government of India, you have people like John Lawrence, etc., um, to you know, Viceroy Canning, who are talking about, well, hang on a second, we also need to reestablish power. So we, when we need to do that, we need in, intermediaries who are loyal. So there's very, you know, from the from the upper echelons, there is a thing that this needs to be done at the local level. We just can't go on, you know. Uh, so very quickly, you have this question of compensation uh, to who's loyal. Now, obviously, when you say who's loyal, you have to. You, there needs to be some process of carrying this out. And what happens after the rebellion is that, uh, you know, the question of compensation is then weighed upon on the heads of the local, um, you know, it comes across and the local authorities have to deal with that. So, well, how do we, how do we create a loyal base um, and how do we compensate them for their losses, right? Um, and this then um, is carried out, this process is carried out by, uh, by property, uh, through the mechanism of property. And... Uh, and the way they do this is um, it's quite convoluted because what they want to do is they want to compensate people for their losses, but they don't want to compensate by giving cash because the, the state obviously is very um, fiscally, you know, they, they don't want to spend money. On the other hand, you have uh, demolitions taking place in Delhi. So you've got the, you've got the army, which is clearing area, which says it needs a firing line. So it says, well, outside the king's uh, palace, outside the uh, Lal Kila, 
you know, you need uh, so many yards of demolitions. And th- there's a very dense, you know, the, the, the settlements, are quite, it's quite dense and it's quite, you know, uh, what they want to clear up uh, includes a lot of, you know, katras and a lot of mohallas and so on. Um, so they want to clear all this area up. And then, and obviously in, in that, there are people who who they want to say, okay, these are loyal people. They, they might have, um, you know, big mansions, et cetera, or they might have had, you know, people who, who've been, um, so anyway, they have to think about how they should compensate those, but they don't want to give them cash. Um, so you've got this demand coming up, but you've also got the military that says from time and again, time and again, that we need to clear more and we, we need to clear a second round of areas. And so the, the, the level of kind of this firing line needs to be a bit more, right? So, so more properties come into the play. So what the, what the local administration decides to do is they, they try and create, um, you know, they, they say that the, those rebels who were implicated in the rebellion, we've got their houses. And what we'll do is for the ones that we are demolishing, um, we'll make sure that you can go to auction. You get you get you get tickets the worth the value of your. We'll value your houses. We'll value your property. We we'll give you tickets once they're demolished. With those tickets, you then go over and you get you can buy the stuff at auctions. You, know, you can bid the, the value of that. So this is this kind of mechanism that they that they create. Um, obviously, the one when they create uh, tickets, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're actually promissory notes, right? So these are these are notes that they are value for certain things is, is that you can get in the market. And and what I show in the book is is very complicated because you know these tickets change hands. Um, they they change hands. Um, there are people who who buy this who who, who want selected properties. They want nice. They, they're the the rises of Delhi who um, who are largely Hindu but including some Muslims who. Um, who are loyal, so they, they say, well, we want this property. If we if we're, our stuff is being demolished, we want those houses to belong to that elite person there, that Nawab there, and so on. So they've got to deal with that. Then they've got to deal with the fact that there are speculators in tickets who then who can realize that oh look there are auctions going on, so let's uh, let's get these tickets and they and there's there's a, 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 these tickets are changing hands quite frequently so. It's quite chaotic in the sense that the local administration is saying, "Oh my God, okay, what orders have been given? People, look, commissioners change. Uh, this carries on over a, from the, in the 1860s. So it's not just uh, you know it, it, these these debates carry on. The demolitions are happening. Military is asking questions, uh, demolishing, speculation coming in at the time of auction and so on. Uh, and this is this has caused a lot of kind of chaotic, um, cause chaos and uh, problems for the administration in terms of how they should settle the bill." And eventually what you find is that a lot of these people, um, you know, they, they aren't able to settle it properly. So they're, they're, they say that the, the, because they, the speculators are after profit, you know, so, um, and what they say is, well, you should pay them. So the, the, it goes to the Supreme, it goes to the court and the court says, well, actually you just, you know, this, this is too complex. So just pay them, uh, pay everybody profit rather than actually the ones who, who got into it thinking there was profit as opposed to a difference. So everybody tries to, they try to give uh, the, whatever uh, profit they will value that. So, so the point that I was trying to make in that chapter is that, you know, yes, there is this property, there is this basis for, to try and reestablish the reins of power, which is through property. But the mechanism that it goes on is it's so, so twisted and so convoluted that it, uh, yeah, that, and that shows you the nature of yeah, governance in the aftermath. All right. Um, so could you also explain a little bit about the role that uh, the Delhi Municipal Commission, uh, the DMC, uh, took to promote urban renewal in the city and uh, the kind of methods and concepts that they were employing to bring about that into reality? Yeah, so the DMC is like uh, municipalities. Municipalities are formed in the aftermath of uh, the rebellion in the 1860s across India. And, uh, you know, and one of the things that they, they do, they are empowered uh, by the police acts. Um, they have a lot of powers to affect sanitation and, uh, and to, to remove obstructions, etc. cetera, uh, in, in the city. And uh, they, they have these powers vested in them through the police acts. But what's interesting is that, um, you know, unlike, let's say, you know, municipalities in uh, England, for example, they, a, lot of the, a lot of what they call insanitary in, in uh, South Asia, there are many more, um, you know, uh, 
activities that come under the, the the banner of insanitary activities in South Asia than it does. So there's a there's a racialized way that you know that, that the municipality functions. I think. Um, so one of the interesting things in the book that I found out was this was in the the municipal records that I looked at is the way they try they they try and um, they try and sort, you know, there's a new category of the of public space, right? So this is interesting because uh, the, you know, the, what is public, what is private is something that, that comes across in this time. So the municipalities have a certain notion of, of uh, this is public space and you not, should not do this, this, and this, and this in this space. And one of the ways, one of the first things that they, they want to do um, and where that there's a lot of records sort of in the, documentation on uh, is the the removal of chabutras right so chabutras are um, you know chabutra are these platforms right to which uh, which people carry out trades they can be in front of shops uh, people sit on them and they can sell their wares uh, some chabutras can be you know some chabutras are masonry platforms they are they are big platforms some of them are small they vary in size and shape they vary in when they were constructed uh, but the, what the municipality does, it's quite gung-ho at first because it says, oh, you know what, these are insanitary, they're obstructions uh, because they're on public land, get rid of them. And obviously that causes a lot of hue and cry because people are like, well, this has been here since before, this and this and this. And uh, they, they face a lot of resistance. So what they try and do following that is they try and create sort of, they, they try and manage the, the, the question of age. They say, oh, you know, only those that are old will not be touched. The ones that are recent, um, that will be destroyed. Uh, but then again, how do you tell if it's old or not? You know, there are ways that people build chabutras that, that don't look quite re- new. And then, you know, their own commissioners are, uh, you know, they, they employ some that are telling them, oh, you know what, this is not really a very good policy because... Uh, because they'll get people will get away from it. They just put some malva outside in front of their uh, you know shop, and this over time you know they, they made it, make it into a pakka and this a chabutra, and they say, oh, this was there for from a long time ago, and uh, so they can't really they, they have a lot of trouble trying to execute their projects. But and they form a lot of committees and a lot of investigative committees, etc., to try and make sure that there is uh, you know these are not on the streets, these are regulated, etc. But they also come in and they get a lot of flack from the residents when they try and do this. And it, it kind of implicates them in all these problems, these contradictory policies that they create, which, uh, which, you know, which doesn't really affect uh, the, the, what they want, but they do still have a good committee. You know, they have a, they have a, a, a more, a bigger bureaucracy than they, for example, um, started off with. So that, that's what's, uh, what they get as opposed to the removal of all Chibutras, for example. So with the different sections of, uh, you know, Delhi authorities that were contesting in order to make these improvements and go through these initiatives, um, you know, what what is the nature of these involvements of different authorities and how was the public reacting to such uh, um, such intrusion? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, you know, in terms of these various authorities, so one has to realize that, you know, at one level um, in the municipality, you also have some loyal, you know, members who are co-opted in the municipality. But obviously there's a hierarchy. So one one can't forget that there is a hierarchy. There is a deputy commissioner at that point in time who is uh, the, the head of the, you know, the, the municipality. So under him there, and they do employ, um, you know, uh, Indians. And so it's not to say that, you know, there is outright resistance because there is also, there are also people that are co-opted into the system. Um, but, but there are, so there are local committees that are built up, but one tends to find that, you know, in many of these cases, um, it, you know, as I said, that there's a hierarchy of officials, right? And, uh, and, and what, you, what you do have is that uh, you have, um, you know, you have, I, I give this example of, um, Kind of Girdari Lal, this guy who was who was a long-standing official who works in the municipality and so on. He's not very happy with the kind of with, with the kind of uh, the, with the ways in which official uh, you know acts and the policies are carried out. So you also have dissatisfaction of all these um, municipal officials who work. But you also have early on, you know. Um, uh, committees, etc., that uh, that that are that are working for um, um, the the state, the local state, which you know they have local committees which are disbanded because uh, they have Indian members in them, uh, like the local cess committees and local investigation committees. But 
you know the 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 recommendations that they give so to to do this and that they aren't taken very seriously so so in a sense you have people who are being co-opted and the kinds of stuff that they do but they uh, you know the the recommendations that they give require a lot of um you know in, they, their their input at times is not perhaps um you know, responded to in the same way. So, so that's one. Now, in terms of how people react more generally to the municipality, um, you know, it, it depends on. I mean, I, th- I think it's quite contextual. If you think about, you know, water supply and, and drainage, and people are obviously not interested in, you know, their chibutra is being demolished, for example. So there is a there is a risk and a resistance towards that when the municipality or when you know sanitary commissioners want to when they say, for example, then this area is is going to be um, uh, taken away for the the creation of a plantation or whatever it is that you know people are like well we this is where we this is the area that we use to go uh, and wash our clothes and uh, or to to the ghats or so on right so so there is a lot of there there are uh, disputes around that um, there is also a monopolization for example of rights when you know people night soil for example is taken away is carted away and there are agreements made between uh, previously between the Mughals or previous administrations and uh, zamindars that you take away the night soil for your fields at this rate, or you, or, you know, this is how you collect it, or, or these are the people who, you know, but the municipality, for example, then decides that it has a monopoly over these things and it should, it should dictate the prices. It should dictate how people work. It should constrict people. So there are people who are, you know, annoyed with it at that uh, by the z- level of zamindars, but also people in terms of people who clean, right? So, sweepers, for example, and I, one of the things that I've actually talked about is how um, the municipality kind of is very exploitative in terms of uh, sweepers. It does not give sweepers the kind of things that they were they were given previously, and they, this and it tends to exploit them more. So they and uh, it forces them to uh, to do the you know certain types of uh, work for uh, very little. So so there are these disputes that come in. And, uh, and and so, yeah, one has to see it as a very layered thing in terms of, you know, um, instead of seeing it as you know, people of resistance and cooperation, it isn't that it's much more kind of how negotiation happens at different levels in society. All right. So uh, a part of your book, it comes to talk about uh, religious rituals in, in public space, processions. Um, so if you could tell us a bit about uh, the regime's reactions when it came to religious processions and, uh, you know, what were the contradictions that arose, especially when it came to the ambiguity between colonial governance uh, for street processions in particular? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the chapter that I wrote, that, uh, that I wrote in the book was about the Sarugis. So the, the you know, the, the question of Hindu and Muslim um um, animosity and riots and so on in the late middle late 19th century over the over processions has been uh, dealt with in a lot of the literature and one of the things that I was interested in was to see how kind of uh, newer social groups uh, as I call them um, when I say new I say you know uh, the Sarogis for example are quite economically they're powerful. They, they're, they're gens, so they, they're Digambar gens, but they call themselves Sarogis. And one of the things that I looked at was how these people become, you know, these people are become, they, they want, um, what their main demands are that they should be allowed to carry out their religious processions uh, in the, 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 main, the main thoroughfares of the city, right? Now, this is a history to it. Why the main thoroughfares of the city is because in the, in, in the early 19th century, you have Gen, uh, you know, you have Sarogis uh, who are, you know, in in Delhi. There, are, there are a limited number of them. These people who who want to create new temples and they they want to create, you know, and but the and when they try and take their processions out in these main streets, it's it's kind of, it's prohibited because they said, okay, you have smaller streets to take out your processions, but in the in you know, let's say in the main thoroughfares, whether it's Chandni Chowk or otherwise. In Delhi, you can only, it's only uh, Dashera or it is, uh, you know, it's Muharram. These are the big, you know, so the, 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 the main festivals that can go. So there's obviously a hierarchy in which, uh, which the Mughals, for example, early on see uh, the, the festivals uh, there. So it's the main festivals and they cannot be taken out in the, on the same, at the same time. So the Mughals are, uh, think very hard about that. And they say, well, okay, this is for this is for these major celebrations, like the Shera for for Hindus. This is and Muharram. 
Eid, for example, this is this is where you go in Chani Chowk. You otherwise you have your smaller streets to carry out your. Um, so so what they do in the early nineteenth century actually, and so I tr- I retrace some of this. Um, uh, is that they actually try they try their luck when they know that you know there's a new administration in town uh, when the East India Company takes over the city of Delhi. This is slightly before the period, but I try and give some backdrop to this. Is that they try and they they try and um, you know ask the commissioners and so on for permission. They they do it in a very clandestine way. They try and take out processions, etc. And this creates a ruckus and they're banned. Now after the rebellion, they find that uh, that Mughals aren't there. Right, so Mughals, the Mughals have been uh, taken care of by the by the British administration, and there's a new administration in town. It's not the East India Company anymore. Uh, the uh, this is the, the the Crown rule. So, and you have lots of proclamations that are issued by Queen Victoria and so on. That you know, this is a, this is a new government in town, and you know, you know, you have. Uh, equal rights and you have an even-handed approach in equal rights and so on. So they, they find a way in which they say, okay, well, this is now an opp- opportune moment uh, to, to re sort of uh, um, galvanize their, their efforts and so on. So, so, so what they do is they try and lobby the governments, but the, the, but, uh, the officials are, you know, uncertain about whether they should or they should not allow uh, these because these are novel processions. So what happens out of a long um you know, and, and again, convoluted process is they, they actually ban them despite there being an order that, uh, that everyone is allowed on all spaces. So this is the, this is the order, the official Queen Victoria's proclamation. And, but yet the local uh, authorities of Delhi ban um, any sort of, you know, thinking that they're public disturbance, they would call disturbances. So you have this, you have these contradictory orders that are, that are set up. The, on the one hand, everybody can have access to every, all the spaces as long as it doesn't result in public order. But then you also have this fear of of these uh, people rioting and so on, you know, because of uh, because what they what they don't want the local administration is that Hindus and the Sarogi start fighting. All right, they're like, okay, these are the people who are uh, going to be fighting, and then that there is rivalry and so on over marriage and so on, uh, customs and so on. So, so that that takes place, and they and these guys very skillfully Sarogis very skillfully lobby. Uh, different levels of the government over the, a period of 15, 20 years, you know, they, they realize there are contradictory orders. So they, 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 if they say, okay, the local authorities are banned, but then the, and the government of Punjab seems very keen on, you know, on, uh, on reversing this. We're not, not keen, but, they don't, but the government of Punjab is very keen on not intervening in religious customs. So that's the, that's the issue. So they say, well, they're intervening in our religious custom, but you said you would never intervene in religious customs and so on. And uh, so, so there's that uh, angle. So, so they try and uh, maneuver different levels of the government and eventually after a long time are able to successfully uh, lobby and, and reverse the decision to, uh, on their ban. Um, one of the most interesting questions to me come from the last chapter of your book is about the management of traffic in the urban projects um, that the authorities thought were necessary in order to manage uh, successful traffic schemes. If you could tell us or expand a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, the last chapter really looks at urban planning when it comes up in the 1880s and 1890s. And uh, and the question of traffic is, as I argue, is, is linked with the railways, right? So the railways are a big uh, factor in thinking about the city, trying to think about circulation in the city. and. And it's the railways um, which, you know, there's, there are a couple of old hands in, in the administration, like Robert Clark, who is an official that's been there for a long time. And, and he's through the 80s, uh, through the 1880s, uh, he, what he wants to do is to, to think about extension, uh, opening the city outwards. And then in the 1890s, the plans are that we need to make sure the internal circulation of the city is conducive to traffic. Uh, and so what they try and do, uh, or what the clerk of the municipality try and do is to, to think about how, you know, what, what sort of, what sorts of traffic are coming in? Um, how do they approach the railway station? Um, where do they stop? What's pedestrian traffic? They start calculating that. They say, well, how do they, how do they make those, um, those spaces free of, you know, of obstructions? And also, how did they stimulate commercial traffic? You know, so commercial traffic and also commerce in the city. So these are big questions that uh, that they are grappling with at that time. And uh, and but what they're doing while they're doing this at the level of the city, we also have you know the government of India's own plans for 
what needs to happen in terms of Delhi needs to be opened up and uh, for for commercial for railway lines and so on to make it. Uh, the government of India wants to make Delhi the Charing Cross of North India. Uh, so so it has a it has obviously plans which which far exceed the local uh, authorities. So what I try and do in that chapter is to think about you know where does urban planning arise in this process and how it is actually the midst of these contestations that you have plans that are being formulated. You mentioned about the uh, urban rail project. Just wanted to, if you could help us understand the kind of clashes that were there between um, the DMC and the central government when you said that, you know, it was being, it, it was something that was beyond the uh, powers of the local authority. So if you can tell us a bit about the kind of interaction or the collision that uh, these two authorities had. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, the government of India's plans for the railways uh, are to integrate, you know, to, to more, the government in India wants to centralize, uh, you know, its authority through these networks. It, 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 what it does, it, it wants to create uh, new sidings, etc., and, and, and also to regulate it. So it wants to do things on the basis of what it uh, decides is, is best. Um, but the, but the, the municipality is in charge of, obviously, the, the inner spaces and has to formulate plans plans, et cetera, uh, to, to think about circulation in the city. Obviously, it's, uh, you know, it has to do so knowing that the funds for it, it, it can't be over ambitious. This is not the, the time of town planning as it comes up slightly later, right? So so you, in Bombay, for example, it's, the, it's with the plague and in the 1890s that you have uh, b- b- committees, town planning, et cetera, that comes up after that. But the, at this point in time in Delhi, it, there isn't, you know, the, the municipality is the, is the agency through which these, this, uh, any sort of scheme for urban uh, um, uh, planning would be realized. So, so it's also hamstrung in terms of the finances that it has. So every, anything that it tries to do has to be financially uh, viable. So it has to make sure that it, the plans that it has, they have to get money from the government of India, uh, or at least have the government of India sanction that they can get it on the open market loans, etc. Uh, and also that they make it profitable for commercial sections. Uh, when they when they open up these when these places, so uh, so the the plans are are almost uh, never realized in their entirety, uh, because there's always the question of well, well how do we fund this, um, and there's also a question of well uh, we can't fund it so let's try and they try and recreate these plans and that's what's interesting is that they try and reshape it and it becomes something completely different, and what they realize is that uh, that if the government of India is not going to give them this money and you know. Um, and and what, what they can do is to let this, they create laws uh, and they, they, they have this land uh, sitting there and they try, you know, as real estate, it grows in value. So that's one way that they realize is, is a way out of this process where they can't do what they want, but they can keep it. And if it keeps growing in value, then they have that, you know, so they have this Nazul property, as they call it. Uh, which is in their hands, so they will let it grow in value, and then see what they can be done, uh, what can be done at a later date. So that's what that's the that's a, a, a way of dealing with this uh, um, lack of funds, lack of resources, and potential problems that might arise. And of of course, there's the the government of India, which has its own demands, and and uh, for what to do with the outskirts of the city, they have they have plans in which you know they want railway sidings in particular ways, but the but. Uh, the, the municipality is keen that you know there is if there needs to be traffic flows you can't have railway sidings and traffic and all in certain ways so that's when the confrontations come so apart from the confrontations um you know coming to concluding at, at the uh, discussion of the book um you know after 1911 after the course that you've cut it, covered in the book uh, what are some of the kind of uh, features of the colonial authority especially when it comes to urban planning that have retained especially after the time of independence um you know what are some of the key features not features but you could say uh, kind of patterns in in the functioning of these uh, authorities that has come when it comes to urban planning yeah, I mean, I think one of the one of the arguments that I tried to make in the concluding uh, paragraphs of the book, in the conclusion, um, is that you know if you take the 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 municipality today, as you know, there is you know in Delhi, for example, if you take um, the municipal corporation of Delhi, right, the, the Delhi Nagar Nigam, uh, that I think there are legacies of the colonial that can be traced into the post-colonial. And one of the ways that I think about this is the way in which, um, you know, the way in which plans are constantly, you know, the, the, 
I, I've discussed this in terms of you know how how plans for the reorganization of the municipality are constantly being created today. Um, it isn't efficacious in terms of what it sets out to do, but what we do find is that there are, you know, it keeps, so the bif- it bifurcates. So it's been told to bifurcate, it's been told to reorganize itself. So what we do find is that, you know, if you take the sweepers dispute that came, there was a, in the, in the East Delhi, uh, in, I think it was in 2017, if I remember correctly, uh, that, uh, you know, the, the, the sweepers, they went on strike. They said, we're not going to clean unless, you know, and there was garbage on the streets in, the, in East Delhi because the East Delhi Municipal Corporation refused to pay their salary saying we're not, you know, um, the funds, etc. And what was realized after this debate in, and is that, what they'll do is to reorganize this further, the, the municipal corporation further to make it more efficacious. So I'm trying to suggest that, you know, this reorganization, um, the, the, these are certain colonial patterns, right? So there, there are things that we can trace previously in terms of the organized reorganization of state and the development of state capacity. That I think uh, has a certain colonial uh, legacy. So, so in my opinion, there is, um, you know, the way uh, bureaucracy is reorganized, the way it's, it ha- has colonial legacies, particularly in terms of urban uh, agencies, the way they do. So would you say, are there any other kind of colonial legacies apart from reorganization of bureaucracy? Um, when it comes to maybe executing plans or creating plans, um, anything around that? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, um, the, the f- so I think there are lots of ways that this, this question can be, can be thought through in terms of, you know, uh, urban planning or, uh, you know, I've, you know, the, the period that I look at is, is you know, is from, is from 1858 to 1911, effectively, right? And so a lot has happened post-1911 till 19, you know, 1947 and from 1947 till now. So there's obviously a lot that, you know, one can't, uh, you know, one has to look at these, the, this period also critically in terms of the changes that has, have been brought out. So I, I, you know, I don't want to go out and say, oh, this is all, a, a, you know, a state. But I think that what, where I can see patterns is with regard to, uh, let's say, if you take certain agencies, if you take, uh, but urban, you know, planning, etc. you know, you could, if you think about what uh, Steve Legg and others have written on Delhi, you know, you can, you can think about in the way, the 1940s, some have argued recently, there have been articles talking about the 1940s as, as a way of uh, re-effective and organization of the state power, et cetera, uh, and, and uh, land reclamation and land, you know, uh, reorganization. So so there there are arguments to be made there too. But one of the main ways that I saw it was in through this municipal organization. All right. Um, so that that brings us to the end of the discussion about the book. But a couple of uh, concluding questions that I had for you was the kind of relevance that your work carries in in the current contemporary world, and how uh, why do you think it is important for us to go back and understand from how colonial authorities were governing our cities? Oh, that's a good question. A big question. Um, you know. Uh, you know. I'd. Uh, as a historian, I want to, I want to scale down my claims, but I think that, you know, but at the same time, I think I could possibly think about ways in which, uh, you know, I think legacies of the colonial carry on into the contemporary era. That is one way that the book actually adds to the discussions. The other way that the book adds to our discussions is to, to think about state power and policy failure in, in the global South. And I think that there's, there are ways in which we can think about policy failure, uh, uh, urban policy failure, and uh, the, the the longevity of the state, which I think that that is quite interesting ways in which we can we can carry forward these discussions in terms of what's happening with, from the colonial to the post colonial. So there, there's quite clear strands that I think which can we can we can say, uh, which which we can you know highlight. Um, I think in other ways that I I've, you know I I hope that the the book makes a small contribution to thinking about. Uh, also about this period of, of um, and one of the arguments that I made, I mean, I, is that, you know, between 19, eight, between 1858 and 1914, really, which is kind of overlaps with this, with the period of the book, is that the, the arguments that are made by historians is that, that this is the period when colonial power feels quite, you know, secure in its, in its rule. But what I'm talking and I'm trying to suggest is that, you know, this idea of, consolidation is linked to, you know, it's not, it's not really about feeling secure and safe because what we find is that it's fraught with contradictions, tensions, failure, 
but it leads to something that is that is you know in a way strengthens or, or gives longevity to the to the state. So, in a way, I I, th- I hope that we can think critically about this period because really what what you know what you have is that. Uh, for historians, the understanding, I, I suppose, a common sense understanding, is that it's only after. I mean, it's with the with the nationalist movement that kicks off after the 1914, etc., that you have uh, colonial rule being, you know, kind of, and it's before the the rebellion that you have, you know, um, problems of information and, and so on, um, which lead to uh, which lead to uh, the rebellion. But what I'm trying to say is that actually the story in the middle of these uh, in, the, in the latter half is also actually quite complicated. And uh, and one needs to really think about that um, a bit harder, and in terms of instability and consolidation, rather than stability and consolidation, if that makes sense. All right. Um, so uh, we would want to know what uh, project you're currently working on. Is there something that you are currently working on? Any future publications that our audience can look forward to coming from you? Uh, well, thanks. I think uh, you know, that's a good question. I. Um, you know, I'm an early career uh, career scholar, so I have to constantly think about publications. It's publish or perish, pretty much. Uh, but I mean, I'm thinking about publications on uh, on you know urbanism and uh, Delhi and urbanism. Um, you know, I'm for example, I'm, I'm thinking about projects that move on. Uh, there have been recent articles and historians working on the 1940s and 30s and 40s, and so my attention is kind of being. Uh, is in that period of, you know, um, the war and what that does is in the Second World War and the prelude to that and what that does is in terms of reorganization of the urban. Um, so I'm working on that, but I'm also working on, um, you know, projects that are not directly related to, to the urban, but I'm also looking at, for example, um, international organizations in, you know, and, and post-colonial India role in um, in the UN, for example, and what sort of how it uh, deals with health agencies. Um, and so that's where I'm trying to also focus my attention. So it's kind of doing a bit of this and a bit of that, but yeah, trying to get, uh, yeah. All right. Um, so um, a last question about uh, for someone who wants to explore South Asian um, uh, colonial urban history or urban history in general, uh, what sort of suggestions would you have? And uh, something as, as a personal question for myself, is it for people who would want to study this and come into a field such as academia? Um, I've, I've never really heard anyone talk positively about someone making a career in academia. Everyone's been a little skeptical. Or they warn you uh, generally about uh, the vices of, of the field. So, you know, how, how does someone who's aspiring to be an academic in, in say, not just urban history, colonial history, uh, what would you suggest to them? What are the things they should look out for? Uh, what are the early mistakes? Would you say one should avoid, or uh, experiences one should gain? Okay, that's a very good question. Also, because I find myself in a, in a you know, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm an early career academic, so I, I'm going through the motions. But uh, you know, but your question about in terms of what I would recommend to somebody. Um, I think, you know, obviously academia is, is, is very different in different places, but also quite similar in terms of, you know, uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure, at least in the UK to, to publish, publish and publish. Right. Um, I think that the, the, the issue with that we have is that we, you need to get out there, you need to publish as much as you can to get a, to get a job. And I think obviously it, it you know, um, you need to get your book out. You need to get articles out. And uh, that is one thing that keeps you in the game and keeps you, you know, um, getting positions. So I can't stress that enough in terms of, uh, you know, I'm not going to paint a rosy picture of academia because I think the the people that you've spoken to previously have done, you know, have, have given you, uh, have told you the truth about it. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty cutthroat. It is pretty, you know, in a sense that it is a great field to be in, but it is, there aren't many jobs. And uh, and at least in Britain, the the key thing is to actually get you know um, to to publish as much as possible. Now there are problems, uh, you know there there are for example when you publish, uh, you know people prefer university presses. They prefer Cambridge University Press or Oxford University Press as opposed to other university presses. And so there are issues there in terms of uh, publishing. There are issues in terms of uh, you know uh, the, the hiring committees etc. And what they what they so it is also a very racialized uh, thing to think about, you know. So, so, uh, so, but obviously, those what you can do in terms of is to try and think about publishing, is to try and think about 
um, a feasible project that is that is uh, that is you know that you can possibly at least in the UK finish in four years. Um, you know, life gets in the way, so um, so things do happen, um, and I understand that completely. But you know, but obviously the the, the climate is quite harsh, so um, and so realistically, you need to you need to make sure that you know you choose something that is a viable topic that that uh, on the one hand is something that you're interested in, but the, on the other hand that that allows you to have some publications and to. To uh, to stand in this, you know, to have a have some sort of standing in the field when you know that there are odds that are uh, stacked against you. So, so that's one of the things that I would suggest. As a you know, apart from, I, mean, I don't want to get into much of a you know uh, <laughs> my relationship with academia first, but but you know, but I think that it is very rewarding too, um, in terms mm-hmm. of you know you having your work read and acknowledged, and you know, for example, conversation like this. Uh, uh, you know, where you can get your work across to people. So I think that that really is, for me, uh, one of the ways that, you know, you can, uh, you know, what's rewarding about it, really. So I think that that, that shouldn't be lost sight of either. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question. I went about it in a very yeah, secular way, but... Yeah. <laughs> no, no, definitely. That's that's pretty much everyone's been telling me. It's just <laughs> that uh, I've, I've I'm, I'm, I mean, uh, um, I would say I am an aspiring academic myself. I someday aspire to be one. I am actually going to be starting my master's at uh, SOAS uh, soon, in September. Uh, and I mean, history. And I'm kind of uh, very skeptical about myself because this is obviously even quite a financial burden for me to come from here all the way till there so i just want to i mean that there's it's it's just that the interest is so deep that uh, at, at some point i just want to circumnavigate around the issues that everyone it makes me jittery and uncomfortable talking about it but at the same time i do want to talk about it and you know so that people can actually acknowledge that it's not a very easy field to be in and uh, that there are a fair share of difficulties that people face uh, raise, rising up in Quite much of it is also, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it's also pushed by a privilege that people have, certain uh, certain privileges that people enjoy in the society. So, um, you know, and so that that is why I kind of like reach out to academics and ask them, I was like, what kind of picture would you paint or kind of mistakes that you would suggest that, that we avoid doing or uh, something that we can uh, take as an option to uh, keep up, you know, keep ourselves yeah. active in the field, you yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, like, I think that you're making very valid points, and I completely agree that it is, you know, it is, you know, I, you know I'm an, as I mentioned, I'm an early career academic, I've got a young family, you know, I've got to think about, you know, where the next job is, because this is a fellowship that I have, and I, and effectively, you have fellowships until you get a lectureship, right, so you're looking at a period of time in which you've got to, you know, you've got to get a postdoc, you've got to get uh, teaching uh, experience, you've got to get all of this stuff while you have to publish, so, you know, so it isn't easy at all. And then if you've got family and, and, you know, stuff gets in the way, you know, life gets in the way, as I mentioned, it makes it all the more difficult. So, you know, I completely understand what you're saying. Um, I think that, you know, I, I think um, it, I think it helps to have, you know, it's, I mean, you know, I think that it would, it, it helps if you've got, you know, um, some sort of a plan B, um, you know, with, that you could do with academia. And, and that's, I think it's not encouraged enough in terms of, you know, um, because essentially when you do a master and you do a PhD, you're, you, people assume that you're training to be an academic and that's that's what you want to do. And it, it might well be what you want to do. But I think it's also, I think more and more people are coming to realize that, that you should also have a plan B in mind and which, which gives you, you know, a, a fallback option because, uh, because you know that, that that's something that I think should be actively encouraged rather than saying, well, actually, oh no, it's it's a it's lesser than being an academic. So that that yeah. for my sake is something that I would you know for anybody going in, I would say that that you know at the at the expense of some of the some of my academic colleagues looking at oh my god, how did you? But but that is a realistic uh, thing, and I, I would really encourage people who who, who follow mm-hmm. that approach. Yeah, I've kind of been looking at options of maybe even journalism or public policy or diplomacy, things of that sort. So I'm still kind of trying to and, navigate my way. Yeah, and, and, and you know, and people do really well in those professions uh, from an mm-hmm. academic background because the skills that you get, um, you know, are really valued in those professions. And so so one can't, you know, one should lose sight of the fact that actually what you're doing is not just saying, oh, I'm, I'm a... 
uh, MPhil or PhD, you couldn't do it. But actually what you're saying is, look, I have all these skills, which, uh, you know, you effectively, which can be, which can are useful. And there are so many, you know, academics who go on into government, into, um, you know, policy, who will go on into journalism, as you rightly mentioned. So there is scope there. It's just that that has to be acknowledged as mm-hmm. something that can be done alongside academia rather than actually something that is done if you don't get into academia. Thank you. So I think that brings us to the end of our conversation. We are really glad to, to have you on our podcast. Um, thank you so much for joining us. No, thank, thank uh, you for inviting me. And thank you for the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning into this conversation with Dr. Raghav Kishore. We really hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, please consider subscribing to our channel and podcast for more such amazing content. There is a line of series of such amazingly curated interactions with authors and scholars on the history of the subcontinent. Check out our website www.indiacolonize.com for more blogs and podcasts exploring the tales of India's contemporary history. Do follow us on our social media sites for more exciting updates. Until next time, stay safe and stay curious.